Hello and welcome to Peaceful at Heart. My name is Cedric Martin and I'll be your host. Each episode, we're going to take a closer look at the book Peaceful at Heart, Anabaptist Reflections on Healthy Masculinity. We'll jump into the chapters, hear from the authors and contributors, and think a little bit more about what healthy masculinity means in our modern context. Joining us today is Scott Brubaker Zare. Scott, welcome, and, and thanks for your work on this book so we can discuss it today. How are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm doing okay. Um, hanging in there, you know. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Maybe not uh, getting as much exercise as I should uh, during this pandemic. Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. I, uh, I wanted to say I, I really appreciated your, your wisdom and the experience that you brought to this book. Uh, I understand that you completed your, your Doctor of Ministry, uh, and your thesis was around understanding men's experience of God. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that and, and then how that led you into working on this book? Yeah, so, um, well, the whole thing's a progression, you know, like um, this whole topic of experience of God has intrigued me, um, and it has to do with my own my own life and my own story, and I suppose one one significant experience was working in uh, the country of Colombia in South America in the early 1990s, um, mm -hmm. basically right out of seminary, you know, with um, not much pastoral experience, not a whole lot of life experience, and uh, moving into a very difficult context in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And I had, you know, head knowledge of Christian faith, like I, right out of seminary, you know, had some things to talk about Anabaptist theology, knew some Bible, but the people I was working with in this, this small congregation in the, in the poor neighborhood where we were, weren't all that interested about concepts, you know, mm. um, or ideas about God. Like they were looking for, they were looking for something deeper, like a spiritual power or a presence, you know, to, um, to help them get through some really difficult stuff. And as a person, I was what, late twenties maybe? I felt like I didn't have much to give, right? And I, mm -hmm. I realized, gee, a lot of my kind of Christian faith is head knowledge. Like I, I don't have much experiential stuff to draw on, right? And so I, I came home feeling fairly depleted. And um, for the first time went to, um, a retreat center, a Catholic retreat center, um, the uh, Ignatius Center in Guelph, Ontario, and did a, one of these silent spiritual retreats. And um, the woman I had there as a spiritual director said that I had a case of spiritual poverty hmm. and um, that it was a gift. And uh, so this kind of started me on a different trajectory, you know, realizing yeah, there's more to um, there's more to faith than just thoughts and ideas. It has to be some sort of a lived experience. And so, um, this is a bit of a roundabout answer, but this is part of yeah. what led to the topic, right? So, so I started um, going to these retreats and participating in in more well, in, mostly in the Catholic contemplative tradition. Um, I, you know, I dabbled a little bit in the more expressive Protestant forms of Christianity, but it didn't really fit with me. I was, um, I found in the Catholic contemplative tradition, um, you know, groundedness in history and also um, an experiential dimension. But at these things, there were hardly any men, you know, mm -hmm. like I would go on these retreats or go to a workshop and it was always about 80% women. And, 20% or less men. And yeah. so I started wondering, where are all the men? Like are, so I was just, it was a curiosity, right? Like are, yeah. are there others that are, are kind of looking for this like I am? And so that led um, into this research project. Yeah, sort of a, a gap in the market, I guess you'd say. 
<laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't thinking about it that way. Yeah, no, no, but that's, that's fair. Okay, so, so thinking of that then, so what, does, what role does masculinity play uh, in, in the church or, or in your own faith? Yeah, you know, I'm not that all that, I'm not all that interested in masculinity, really. Mm. <laughs> you know, like, a, like, I know there's a whole men's movement and, and stuff, but it's never really appealed to me, you know, like, um, there's some stuff there, but I'm not, I'm not interested in trying to um, promote a, a, a type of masculinity. My, my interest was more, I just noticed, right, that men weren't that present at these things. And I noticed that men don't talk about spirituality as much as women do. Mm. And men tend not to talk about their inner life or their feelings or their fears or sense of self very much. So that was more my, my interest. And I suppose, um, well, I noticed, you know, that um, some of the stereotypes have some truth to them and the stereotypes all, you know, you have to hold them lightly, right? Because uh, this whole, there's nothing set in stone about gender types, right? But in general, um, I find that men focus more on outward things. Like, like they get together, you know, you're at a social thing and men tend to gravitate, at least in my age group, I don't know about yours, but yeah. the women kind of gravitate and the men kind of gravitate and they talk about different things. So the women are talking about the relationships, the kids, um, how they're feeling uh, about work. And the men tend to talk about what's happening in the world or ideas or a problem they're fixing. They tend to be more outward things than relational or inward, right? So, so I think one thing um, where men can, can grow is expanding into that, um, that area of inner exploration a little more. Yeah, yeah, for sure. With... With your chapter, you shared a lot about uh, your research, and, and you had a lot of great insight. And but one thing that stood out to me was that the the men you were interviewing, uh, several said that they had uh, an easier time in a one on one setting than in a group. Uh, what what do you make of that? Yeah, so I think a number of them said to me, you know, they they haven't really talked about this with anyone before. Mm -hmm. Like when you talk about what's what are your experiences of God? Or like they had a hard time um, really getting their heads around. They had a lot of questions about who God is, right? And that's a whole other topic. But you could also say experiences of God in, in the sense of experiences of depth or meaning where they learn something about themselves or they come in touch with something profound that... that um, strikes a chord or elicits tears or something. Um, and they said they don't really talk about these kind of things much. And so it felt, feels a bit vulnerable to talk about them with other people, you know, because they're not, they're kind of ambiguous, they're unfinished, they're, they involve emotions. Um, and so I think maybe I got the sense they might feel a bit embarrassed, right? Or um, it just, it was easier for them to talk one-on-one -on -one hmm. in a group. Yeah, yeah. So leading from that, in, in the summary of your report, you indicate that uh, the men you interviewed, they did not speak about um, necessarily internal things. They didn't speak about their, their own sin, their, their problems, their addictions or weaknesses. What, what work do we need to do in our churches and, and in our communities to counter this? Um, I mean, how, how do we create uh, environments that, that men can feel comfortable in and, and to share their, their feelings and their experiences? Yeah, right. I guess, you know, it's probably true for most people. You don't want to talk about 
you don't talk very much about the secret um, pains or mm. wounds, right? You know, they're very personal things. So it's no surprise that, that um, so I think many people, probably men in particular, they have things they suffer with that they suffer with alone. Mm. Um, and certainly Christian faith is about being honest and, and, and opening yourself up fully to Christ and, and confessing in a sense or, or laying yourself out there and, and experiencing forgiveness and acceptance, you know, so that it, it seems like it should be or is meant to be part of church life, but, you know, it's, it's not really. Um, mm. So how to, how to create spaces for that? That's a good question. You know, um, they have to be, I don't know, safe spaces, a, a group that would be, a, a sharing group that would be willing to come together just to, um, yeah. you know, to, to share what's going on or what um, some of the things that they're dealing with and to know that it's a confidential group. And, and also for men, I think, Maybe again, I don't know, not just for men, but you know, a group where people aren't there to try to tell you how to fix it or mm. judge you for, for having this experience or this thought or this feeling, right? So there's, yeah. there's also a fear that, oh, they're going to think less of me or they're going to think oh, I'm more, I should be more mature than that or mm. I shouldn't be struggling with this, you know? And, and so we have to create spaces in the church where there can be those places of of openness and and acceptance i think yeah yeah no that, that makes sense to me and 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 leading from that you, you talk about the importance in your chapter of of male only groups and um and when i uh, you you also acknowledge the fact that there's been a, a history of exclusion um and so i know for myself personally when i i first started attending my church uh, I, I found myself not wanting to join a men's group as I felt that it, it could be exclusive and, and why couldn't we just all be part of these uh, mixed groups. But um, I, I think that you're right in that we do need to think about having these safe spaces for men and to share their experiences and that's how we're going to take those those first steps. So um, what, what, what do you think we need to, how do we get past that discomfort and, and help these groups gather, offer safe spaces and, and not feel exclusive or, or perhaps elite? Yeah, there's a lot of, um, I mean, we, we carry a whole history of patriarchy, right? And male, mm -hmm. male privilege and um, whatever, male groups where others aren't involved. And I'm not interested in that at all, you know? Um, yeah. And I'm not, it's just more a practical thing for where, where people feel comfortable, right? And um, if men are going to open up, some for some men, not all, but for some men, they feel more comfortable with other men. And I think sometimes we feel a bit intimidated by women because mm. women speak more naturally or are more gifted at um, talking about what, what their emotions are or what it means. And men... Um, kind of struggle with that. Like, I, I don't quite know what I feel. Like, what am I supposed to be feeling? Like, I, yeah. I know what my ideas are about something, but how, um, you know, and I think sometimes men don't want to look like dumb in front of women or, mm. or embarrass themselves or, you know, yeah. or, or be laughed at by women, right? And, and so for, for that reason, maybe a, um, male only group, but I, there could be, there should be groups for all sorts in a church, you know? Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. So, um, so I guess in, in terms of short term, it's, it's finding these spaces that men can gather, but in, in terms of the long-term vision for the church, we need to do a better job on, on, I guess the, the front end with the, with our youth and with our children and, and getting them, 
more accustomed to sharing their feelings so that we don't have this problem ongoing for many years and that and the boys can grow up to be men that that can feel safe sharing their feelings and their experiences yeah yeah and i think um i mean my interest as a pastor is that there's there's ways that we that we can grow spiritually right in as people in the church um that there's ways we can engage with with others with um, spiritual practices, right? To um, like our our Protestant tradition, um, Mennonites included, you know, is is fairly much a um, a head centered approach, you know, like. Um, and I think the faith is meant to be, it's transform the whole person, right? And so um, how, how do we do this in the church? Like, what are the ways? Um, and th- th- what are the ways? Sometimes I think people think, oh, you have to be sort of super spiritually interested or mm-hmm. at a certain level of spiritual maturity to do something like this. Well. I think that can be a barrier, you know, we have to find ways of where people can um, share their experience, share their questions, search for God, talk about experiences of, of depth with each other without having to, you know, to be super conversant in theology mm-hmm. or that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, in, in in a theoretical sense, we've we've talked about how how these groups could gather and and how these these men could gather in groups. Uh, say they're meeting regularly. What what might men gain by being more in touch with their inner self and and with their spiritual life? Yeah. So I think. Um... Well, wow. You know, like. I think it can be a freeing experience. Like I think Mm -hmm. um, as they grow spiritually, you know, um, they can experience some healing, you know, in maybe being able to face some things that they haven't faced and the kind of freedom um, and liberation that comes from that. Um, It can mean getting a bigger perspective, right? Like, realizing some of my the things that have concerned me maybe aren't the main purpose of my life maybe there's bigger purposes that are there that i haven't really clued into you know and Mm -hmm. um and wow maybe i'm experiencing some deeper friendship for the first time or or a significant community and i don't feel so lonely and i don't feel Mm -hmm. like i'm I'm just slogging away by myself. Um, uh, Maybe some, you know, sense of energy and calling for a new project or getting involved in a social issue, working with others. Um, Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, that sounds like a a great hope that I'm sure every pastor has for their congregation and and men and women included in that for sure. Yeah, I, uh, Scott, I I really want to thank you for your time today. I've really enjoyed our conversations. But uh, before we go, do you have any any sending thoughts to leave with us as we go into our day? Yeah, so... um... Well, this is... Another thing I noticed, I mean, this is another topic, right? But yeah, um, the 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 lang- our language, our church language of the Bible, of theology, for whatever reason, with a number of men that I interviewed, it wasn't a language they felt comfortable using. It somehow didn't connect mm-hmm. with them. And so I think there's a lot of work we have to do on understanding and and sort of reinterpreting our language. It's it's rich language but it's it's got a lot of baggage for people and it has a lot of connotations for people and there's blockages um and they 
And so I think, you know, um, we have to invite people to explore their spirituality, maybe not forcing them into that language, but, you know, finding other language and then, then making as, as it's possible, then making some links, you know, well, mm. what is what you're talking about? How does that maybe fit with or connect to this language in the Bible or yeah. what is that? How does that connect with what Jesus was all about or what Jesus purpose was like, you know, but, but don't start there. Cause it's a, it's a barrier oftentimes, you know, it's been, yeah. it's been kind of forced on people or there's a sense that you have to believe this to be a Christian. And a lot of the stuff doesn't necessarily make sense. Didn't really make sense to men, you know, like, well, they haven't really figured out some of this stuff, this language. And um, so I think we have to be open to really, to not holding it too tightly, but to, just like I've been saying, like start with where people are at and then make the connections. Yeah, yeah. What I'm what I'm hearing from you is inclusion and accessibility, and that's something that uh, is is I mean, it's a very important issue in, in all aspects of life, but especially in, in the church context. And how do we how do we make the church inclusive and inviting? Yeah, and at the same and at the same time, you know, like sometimes I I notice then in that effort to be inclusive, you kind of drop drop the Christian language or drop the particulars, right? Um, drop things that, but I, so I, I don't want to say that. I want to say like be welcoming and inclusive, but still, still be in dialogue with the tradition, right? Still be in dialogue with the Bible. Don't don't use it as a straitjacket, but say it's a it's it's our source of, um, it's our source of inspiration. But it's it's a bit complicated, and there's some 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 of it that's maybe. Uh, not that helpful now, you know, or, or needs to be reinterpreted, but um, don't throw it out. Just keep working with it, but be free to work with it. And, you, you know, be free to s- suggest alternate interpretations and uh, yeah. 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 Sometimes, really? I think people don't, sometimes I think people don't want to come to the church because they feel like you got to go there and it, it, you kind of got to squeeze into this straight jacket or now you have mm-hmm. to, you know, believe that Jesus is coming soon or that um, people who don't believe in Jesus are going to go to hell or something like that. You know, I think it's, that's really unfortunate. I mean, I'd like to think of the church as a place to engage with the deepest questions of life in, in dialogue with a very rich mystical and biblical and theological tradition, you know, and, we're we're on the are on the way. We're we're working with it. We're bringing our questions. We're and we're be, we're allowing ourselves to be critiqued by it. But we're also not taking everything at face value or the way it's always been described to us, right? And so I saw okay. if the church could be that sort of dynamic place, still holding on to it, but but allowing for this, would, I think it would be healthier. Yeah, yeah, the freedom to to grow and to. To, to become something better. Yeah, I, I appreciate your, your insight there, Scott. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks, Cedric. It's been fun uh, talking. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely been good. Well, I hope you have a great day. Thank you very much for being here. Okay, bye for now. Peaceful at Heart was recorded in the city of Takaranto, the land covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. This is the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. We all eat out of the dish, and all of us that share this territory with one spoon. We want to acknowledge the ancestral lands and waterways of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Seneca, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Takaranto is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We wish to thank them and any other nations who cared for this land. 
colonization is a continuing form of oppression, so it is important that we acknowledge the lands and digital spaces that we are holding and taking up. We remember the acknowledged and unacknowledged, recorded and unrecorded, past, present, and future. We are all treaty people.